Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, I, I think, to be honest with you, I, I need to sit down, honestly, uh, because he took everything I, I wanted to say uh, today. You know, that tells me that the same spirit that is at work in my life is at work in your life, my brother, because that's exactly what I wanted to talk about here. Uh, that we are wholly owned by God. So um, it's encouraging to know that I'm, 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 I'm not, uh, what you call, indispensable. Eh? Uh, God uh, can raise men who, who can say exactly the same things that I want to say. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, now we are actually in the book. Uh, we know how Philippians was started. Uh, the congregation there, we, we read last week uh, in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 16, we saw how it was uh, started. We saw the first uh, converts, uh, you remember a lady by the name of Lydia, who was a businessman, a business lady, uh, who sold purple, and purple was of royalty, and we see that it's not only her who was converted, but it's also her entire household. And when you read Acts chapter 16, going downwards, you see also that uh, the jailer uh, was, was converted. And that's how the church, the congregation started. So who is the first convert, according to our question? Who is the first convert in Europe? It was the lady by the name of Lydia. Lydia was the first convert in Europe. Um, uh, as per the questions in our in our group, uh, let's get to the book uh, of Philippians um, from verse one. Uh, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayers with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this, that he who began the good work in you will carry it on unto completion until uh, the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Philippi uh, was named after uh, Philip uh, who, of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great. So uh, the place uh, Philippi was named after Philip Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great. It was a Roman colony. It was colonized by Rome. Uh, the place was colonized by Rome, even though there were Greek-speaking people there, but in the main, the law that operated was Roman law. It was a small Rome there. 
and uh, it had a status of, um, you know, a proper Roman colony, you know, uh, like all the other places that were in Italy. Uh, so uh, Philippi had the same status as uh, those that are found within the Roman colony. As a result, if you were born in Philippi, you had so many privileges. If you had the citizenship of being, a, you know, from Philippi, you had great privileges. You didn't pay tax, you know, a personal tax, and you didn't also pay land tax. Who wouldn't want to have such privileges? I mean, it was such a, who, did, who wants to pay tax? I show friends, who likes paying tax? Eh? I mean, you should have went to Philippi. And we know Rome. Romans would make you to pay tax, but those who were in Philippi did not pay tax. They had the same status as those who were in Italy. So um, it was a great privilege to be a citizen of this place called Philippi. In 52 uh, AD, um, Augustus, who, 42 AD, Augustus was the first Roman emperor, uh, sent uh, some of the veterans to to, to, to Philippi, you know, because of how important he considered Philippi to be uh, to Rome, so that they can guard the interest of. So this was an important place. This was a place that was under the Roman colony, but they were Greek-speaking people. It is assumed that there were 17,000 people who were living in that area. 60% of the people who were living in that area were of Greek origin and then 40% uh, were of Roman origin. So even though it was a Greek area, but it was it was it was a small Rome. Eh? It was Rome had superimposed itself on this great city of Philippi. So having given you that background then let's look at the passage. Paul and Timothy, born servants of Christ Jesus. Is there anything that you are picking up from there? Brother Spusiso? Oh, Brother Spusiso is even quoting ahead of us. Né? My brother is quoting prayer, will come to prayer. But just from this introduction, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus. What is a bond servant? What is a bond servant? What is a bond servant? Am I a servant at you talk? Am I a servant at you talk? Yeah. What is a servant? What is a servant? Do you have servants at home? Those of you who have houses, do you have servants? Eh? <laughs> what is a servant? Those who are, who are business owners, do you have servants? Oh, you like calling them employees, <laughs> not servants. The, 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 the term the born servant is from the Greek word called doulos. Doulos is a servant or slave, can be translated as servant or slave. So Paul is saying, Timothy, Paul and Timothy, born servants of Christ Jesus. What do you think he's saying? And I want you to think, I was expecting Brother Dugi to answer this question more than all of you. Eh? Yeah, he, he, that's how he describes himself, Brother Dugi. He says he's a born what? Servant. He's a slave of Christ, Jesus. Are we slaves of Jesus? Are we slaves? I'm a slave of, of, of Jesus, eh? Yeah. What are the characteristics of a slave? What are some of the things that we know about slaves? They are old, eh? Brother Doki, you, you are talking about exactly my point. The, the owner has one full custody. Are you owned by Christ? I'm old. And fully owned, not 
Ajani Ong. Eh? That's the first thing that we know about a slave. What else do we know about slaves? Come on now, it's cold, I know, I know it's cold, eh? But let's, 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 let's move, let's move. What, what else? A slave is owned by the master. Number two. They work for no pay. Yeah, my brother is saying they work for no pay. Or maybe you can say payment in kind in other, in, in, you know, context where they pay you with food, they pay you with clothes and, 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 but, but, but it's not always the case, isn't it? Yeah. All right. What else do we know about slaves? Quickly. What else do we know about slaves? Hey, time is not on our side. What else do we know about slaves? Um, they do exactly what the master desires. They do exactly what the master desires. Can a slave to a door and say, I, no, today I, I, I've had enough. And they come up to three. First time you said I must do it. Second time you said, ah, if I count up to three, I'm not going to do it. They do exactly. You know, sometimes we sing songs. And sometimes I don't think we understand the meaning of the songs that we sing. When, where he leads me, I will follow. Whatever he says, I will do. Do we always do what the master requires of us? Where he leads me, I will follow. But he tells you to go and preach the gospel, you are not going. A slave does exactly what the master instructs him to do. What else, what else does a, a slave do? But I want to go back to the first point. A slave is wholly owned. The master has sole custody over that slave. Do you know, brethren, that you are wholly owned by God? You are no longer your own. Paul says in the same book of Philippians, it's no longer I who lives, but it is Christ who lives in me. Brother Rivo, you are owned by God. There's an idea of ownership to, to, to this relationship. I think it's there with this concept of slaves. Is what, what status do slaves have in society? Are they up there? It's a lowly position, isn't it? It's a humble position. So when you say you are a slave, it means you are willing to assume that lowly status. Even though he was God, Philippians chapter 2, but he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but he humbled himself, eh? and he assumed the status of being a, what? a servant, a slave, even though Jesus was God, but he was willing to occupy that lowly status. I don't think Paul is just writing that is a maybe there's a point, maybe there's an agenda, brother Tab, that he's pushing here. Maybe he wants to tell you, number one, yes, you are owned, you are not yourself. Do you know First Corinthians chapter 6? What does First Corinthians chapter 6 say? Your body is the temple of who? Of God. You are not of your, you are not your own. You 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 belong to God. So use your body. Do, do we, do, do we, even when we use our bodies, brethren, do, do, are we cognizant of the fact that this is not my body? I cannot do with it anything I want to do. You know, feminists will do. Will do. This is your body, isn't it? You can do whatever you want to do with your body. But biblically, we learn that your body is a temple of whom? Who smokes it? I, 
those who laugh, who are laughing, are you, is, it, is it a laughter or <laughs> say, hey, he's talking about me now, this man. <laughs> your, your bodies, brethren, our bodies are not our, ours. This body is owned by God. God has full custody over this body. I cannot do as I please. I cannot decide to use the members of my body for sexual immorality. Eh? But I can only use this body for his own purposes. Do you realize that God has full rights over your body? Or it's still mine? So coming to the concept of, of a bond servant, that there's an idea of ownership. The second idea that is there, that there's an idea of, of humility there. A slave humbles himself in front of the master. A, a slave is willing to take instructions from the master. A, a slave understands his position. A, and, and, and you will see in chapter 2, Paul is going to talk about humility. That it, you, you must co consider others better than yourself. Eh? Is that our attitude? Do you consider others better than you? Or you think you are better? Prasbu, is that your attitude? I'm better than others. Eh? Do you consider others better than you? Are you humble, my brother? If I may ask. <laughs> it was a trap. Eh? <laughs> if he says, I'm humble, then he has lost humility. Then I know he's arrogant. Because you, you can never lie. Eh? It's a struggle. Humility is a struggle. We are always stri stri striving to become like Christ. Even though Christ knew his status, even though he knew his deity, even though he knew that he is God, but guess what? He humbled himself. I think, Brother Chris, Paul is, is talking about, he, he describes himself as such because there's something he wants to address in these congregations. He, he wants to address the idea that we are only humble. Sister Nontobe. Um, so there's a question, right? Yes. So Ephesians 6 verse 5, um, we wait in humility and reverence for those who are masters with respect and fear yes. and with um, sincerity. Of heart, just yeah. as we would obey Christ. Yeah. So it's something that I'm going through right now. So I'm asking, say, should we obey our masters, our like earthly masters, earthly masters, yeah. as we actually, you know, as right now we say that we need to be humble, we need to do exactly what they say, and you know. Ah. Uh -huh. So I just want to know, as Christ, because this actually says that. Yeah. Is this desirable for Christians to obey their masters? Because then you are an ambassador of Christ, isn't it? You know, my sons and I are busy reviewing what are done with Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter, uh, the book of Genesis. And what you see that is distinct with Joseph, everywhere he went, he was an obedient servant, isn't it? And the Lord blessed him. I'm telling you, if you are a Christian and you don't get promotions, I know something is wrong with you. Oh, it's impossible. For a Christian not to get a promotion. Ah, no, no, no. You have Christian values that set you apart from the rest. I'm telling you, if you are a Christian and you stay in the same position, I, the problem is not your employer, it's you. Because if we do what the Bible says we must do, you see, sometimes when you think of yourself as I must obey my master, people think it's it's to our disadvantage, isn't it? Hey, to, to make me a slave, to lower me, to do all these things. But honestly speaking, you need to obey. Actually, it's Christians who need to obey their masters more than the worldly people. So that people can learn from you, isn't it? But wow, look at that guy. Uh, brother, you're a businessman. Do you like an obedient person? Worker. Yeah. Do you like an obedient worker? Oh, which boss? Who likes a rebellious worker? 
sister, you are representing Christ. So when you obey your employer, you obey them like you would obey who? Christ. You submit to them like you would submit to Christ. And that will set you apart. Because not many people, sister, hey, it's lonely in that lane, isn't it? In the lane of submission, it's very lonely. You have unions, you have people who always want to, you know, uh, become activists at work. But I'm telling you, if there's one thing that can set you apart, is your obedience in your submission. Some of your employers can even want to become Christians, ne? because of your conduct. So, um, this is my philosophy, and this is what we need to implement all of us. Wherever you are, it's not only at work, ne? understand that you are an ambassador of Wherever you are, even at school, brother, yeah, where do you, you are doing load shading on us. <laughs> but I'm saying, even there, you obey, but you obey them in the Lord. Ne? In other words, if they ask you to do ethical things, uh, you say so. Yeah. I obey you, but when it comes to these unethical things, I'm not going to do it. So, Sister Lord, no, no, if, if there's some anyone who has to be obedient, it's a Christian. Now that's that's my that's my take. When you read books like that, as pastoral epistles, yes, and, and all you, you you will see that things like that were addressed in the New Testament all yeah. the way because at that time when the gospel came, slavery was bad yes. for some reason. Yes. And people were working for other people just like today. Uh -huh. So that was addressed throughout the Bible uh -huh. that we need to respect those in authority. And the Bible said they are placed in authority by God. Do, don't you think, brothers and sisters, that Paul wrote these words deliberately? of born servants because he understood that in that Roman environment you know, they would understand immediately when he says he is a born servant of Christ. So I think that's that's the way to go. Uh, if you are here and you are a Christian and you are rebellious, let's repent. You know? Yeah, let's repent. My brother. Yeah, thank you. I just want to know. So where is the place of asking for Wants you. Your salary? Well, maybe salary or anything because now yeah. it's not yeah, obedience is important from yeah. But from the other side too. Yeah. You expect some things. Yeah. So when those things don't come, yeah. So you continue being obedient. Yes. So what here is a situation where your employer is not paid, is not increasing the salary. Right? Or is not giving you what is due to you, isn't it? Do you continue being obedient to your employer in that situation? Or you hold with your feet and go to a different employer? The second thing you wanted to answer. What do we say? What do we do? Oh, that's what I was wanted to. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah, he will speak, he will represent the workers, ne? because uh, employees, ne? employers, because he's an employer. Okay, what do you do, brother? Yeah. I, I wanted to find scriptures that uh, uh, talks about things like that, but yeah. I was never to really find it there. Yeah. I, I believe as Paul was speaking to the slaves, to yeah. the Christians who were slaves, yeah. he also addressed masters yeah. that had slaves. Uh -huh. So they were all expected to behave in a way that pleases the Lord. Whether you were a master or you were a slave, whether you were an employer or an employee, yes. you had a responsibility yes. uh, towards your slave, towards your employee, uh, vice versa. Yeah. And, and one of the things that you need to note about this, because this has been used against the church, ne? that the Bible used to support slavery. Ne? And so we can't follow the Bible because it supports slavery. But what I've observed, and what, what, what one of the brothers here has observed, is that whenever the Bible 
it, it acknowledges that slavery was there, you know. But whenever the Bible comes into the picture, it is there to improve and preach for the conditions of slavery to, to be improved. Look, look at Ephesians chapter, is it chapter 6 that talks about slaves obey your, your masters. And also it talks about masters that they need to treat their workers well because there is a master who is above them, isn't it? So, yes, the Bible does not deny that there is slavery in society. Yeah, there is slavery in society. It's what it is. The Bible, it did not abolish it, but what the Bible said is, let's work towards improving the conditions of slavery that, that are there. So, if you ask me, are you going to stay in a workplace where you are not fairly compensated for your, your efforts? I don't think there's any scripture <laughs> that supports that notion that you need to stay at whatever cost, even when the conditions of work are not. Because the contract binds both, isn't it? Yeah, so you play your part. This is, this is what I'm trying to encourage you. Play your part. And if we play our part, we might find that we don't even have to have a union, isn't it? To protect us because we are playing our part as God's people. I'm not saying it's easy. I also find it hard to submit. Sometimes your employer says something and you don't agree with it. And hey, now you have a problem, brothers. And when I don't agree with something, I simply don't agree with it, isn't it? But I'm learning. I'm sorry. I'm learning. Employers have power, ne? Uh, church, employers have power, ne? Yeah, they can also help you to submit, ne? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm getting assistance uh, at the present moment to submit. I'm still a young preacher who's, who's, who's from a background of uh, industrial relations. I was trained as an industrial relations. You know, the unions, that's my background, you know? I hate injustice. When I think, when I see injustice, I don't tolerate injustice. I was taught about unions and how they operate and the labor relations act and all those things. But submission is needed even when you know those things. Submit to your to your employee. Yeah. Yes. Sir. So we are saying that uh, being a slave is not a good thing. So what since the slave uh, obey and Yeah. The, the Bible did not put slavery in place. Do you agree? God did not say, let there be slavery. No. Slavery is something that is in this world, isn't it? And so, whenever the Bible intervenes, it's saying, improve the conditions. You remember Onesimus? Onesimus in the book of, not Philemon, Philemon. Yeah, Philemon. <laughs> uh, Onesimus was a state. And you know what was interesting? You know what was interesting? According to the research I've made around this subject, Whenever employers became uh, Christians, they freed their servants. Interesting, yeah? Most of the employers who became Christians, they engaged in the process called manumission. Manumission is a process where you free the slaves. So most, most brothers did not feel the need to do it to still continue having a slave. And actually, Paul says to, uh, who's that man? Um, Philemon, he says to Philemon, treat him as a brother. Yes, he ran away from what? From your house. Because that guy ran away. We don't know whether he stole money from Philemon, but Onesimus ran away. His name means what? Useful. Not useless, ne? And so Paul is playing on the, on the name. He says, yeah, he was useless to you before he became a Christian, but now I'm returning him to you because he's very useful to me and he will be useful to you. So, my brother, the Bible that does not, it, it didn't establish slavery. Slavery is something that is in the world, but usually it tries to improve the conditions and also most people have been encouraged by Christianity not to continue being slave owners but treat people in a humane way. Brother Chris, thank you.
I like this is the last comment, man. On slavery. Yeah. One, Oof. Just, uh, just one, one comment on it, it, it is that by affirming the equal value of every human being, yeah. that Christianity ultimately made slavery impossible in a, in a, yeah. in a society that actually followed Christian principles. Yeah, beautiful stuff, beautiful. So, what is the point that we are pushing here? It became irrelevant to own, to, to have, uh, uh, you know, slavery because the Bible pushes for equality. Alright, let, let's continue. And uh, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. Why does Paul call them saints? What is a saint? A saint is a set-apart person, consecrated for God's holy use. Are we slaves? Are we saints, church? Do you have a saint here? Who is a saint here? Brother Chris, I, I know you. You are not a saint. <laughs> Who is a saint? I, 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 my brother, yeah, that, that brother, we can think of him as a saint, you know? That one in the back, look, Shem, he's so nice. He's a nice brother, you know? He's a saint. Now, a saint means a set apart person. Brethren, if, if there's one thing I'm, I'm going to impress upon you today. You are wholly owned by God. Né? God has sole custody over you. You are a slave. And not only are you a slave, but you are a slave that has been set apart for God's only use. Do not let the world use you, isn't it? Because you have been consecrated. You are God's prized possession. Eh? Were we bought at an expensive price? Yes, we were bought at, a, at an expensive price. So that we can be set apart for God's use. Do you feel like you are being used by God only, my sister? Do you feel, or do you get a sense that you have, you, have, you, have, you have arrived at that point where you feel like I'm only used for God's purposes. You never get there. Ne? It's a process. Ne? Who sets you apart? Who sets you apart? Do you set yourself apart? Or are you set apart at baptism? God says, this one is mine. This one is going to be used only for my purpose. Justice is my instrument, is my chosen person. But even though you are set apart by God, there is a process of sanctification. You know sanctification? You must also set yourself apart from the world, didn't it? The Bible says, if you become a friend of the world, you become an enemy of God. The love of, of the world leads to animosity with God. You cannot play both. You cannot have both your leg in the world and in the, in, in, in the church. Now he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, I, I, Brother Chris, I sometimes want to... Paul was writing to a Roman colony. He's writing to people who are colonized by Rome. And in Rome, they had a lord, isn't it? Who was the lord of Rome? Caesar. And here is Paul, writing to people who are colonized by Romans. He's saying there is lord, and the lord is who? It's Jesus Christ. I think that for me stands out. How do you call Jesus Christ lord in a colony? If you call Jesus Lord in the colony, would you be arrested? Because you must have one Lord, and that Lord must be Caesar. I don't know. Why, why did Christians get imprisoned in Philippi? We don't know. Verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Church, here I want to input. I want to know from you. Do you have those people in your life 
Whenever you think about them, you want to thank God. Do you have people in your life, my brother? Whenever a memory of them comes and preoccupies your mind, you simply want to thank God. Do you have those people in your life? Yeah. Who, who are those people? My mom. Your mom. I thought you were going to say my preacher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whenever I think about brother justice, I, I just, it, the remembrance of, oh, my mom. Your mom, I, let me ask you again. Uh, who, who are those people? <laughs> Brother Amos, do you have those people? Yes. Yes. Do we know how old was the church in Philippi at this time? Last week we were talking about when it was established in the book of Acts and stuff like that. Yeah. Now Paul is writing here this letter to the church there and from what I see, I don't know if those were official positions, but yeah. something about the answer. Yeah. Uh, from my recollection of the background we, we did, I think the church was established in AD 49 to AD 50, and he wrote this letter in AD 60 to AD 62, during the time when he was in prison for two years in Rome under house arrest. So from AD uh, 59 to AD 60, how many years? Yeah, so it was there for, for long. It was read. Actually, he is, this is the only letter, this is the only letter where the Apostle Paul is greeting the one, the deacons, and then, this is the only letter where he, he wrote when he is greeting, the, he says, listen to the greeting, we missed that one. He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including overseers and deacons. Actually, another version says, together with overseers. The word overseer there is uh, episcopus. That's the word that he uses there. Some uh, people call them overseers, you know. And so he says, to all, he, this is the only letter. I'm going to have a quiz in December. Ne? We need to have our quarantine ne? and ask you which letter, which is the only letter that where Paul sends his regards to elders and deacons. Obviously, I ah, people are looking at me saying, "Ah, that one will be easy." Ne? But I'll be asking this question, and we'll see who's going to answer this thing. So, guys, we are going to have elders, we are going to have deacons, but isn't it interesting that he doesn't greet them as a separate class? He says, together with what? Overseers and deacons. He says, I'm greeting you together with them. In other words, they are also, there's an equality there. Isn't they are not a special class. Actually, Paul is emphasizing more their role. And some people have argued, Brother Amos, that actually he's not talking about two people, overseers and deacons. Some have argued that he's actually talking about the same people, that they are overseers, but who have the duty of being one? Servants. But I argue that he's talking about two people because he's using the word episcopos for an elder and he's using the word diaconos for a deacon. So these are two separate words, but some people have argued that he's using that way. I thank my God in all my, in my remembrance of me. Brethren, whenever I think about Hilltop Church of Christ, I thank God. Whenever I think about Brother Tawotaha, Amen. I love you, bro. You know me? Yeah. Brother Whenever I think of you, I love you, bro. Ah, brother Chris. Yo, whenever I think of you, I get to the key thing. But whenever I think of brother Chris, you know what? I just thank God. I, God, we came, we, we cross paths with brother Chris. Ah, bro, I always thank God. I even named my one of my sons Chris. 
That's how much I thank God. I thank God for you, Spusi Sotokubo. Where are you? Man? Whenever I think of you, I'm like, hey, I'm from far with brass pussies. Aye, you're thinking ah, you are special, you're the only one. No, whenever I think of brother, I was legit on good. Brethren, this brother was with me from the onset when we started at Hilton. He used to come to my house. Bro, I miss those groceries you used to bring. Man. You no longer bring groceries now. Man. Do I have a, do I have a right to remember him that fond me because of the good things he did for me? Paul is saying exactly that. Listen to what he's saying. He says, For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. Sister Nontobel, do I have a right to remember him fondly because he used to bring me groceries or I was using him? <laughs> I know, now I think this relationship is, is I was using him. <laughs> no. Paul was given a gift by the church at Philippi. They sent, of all the churches, this church sent a gift to Paul while he was in prison. And Paul is saying, man, I have every right to feel the way I do about you. I remember you fondly. Every time when I think of you, I, oh, I, I just want to thank God. And look, listen to his prayer, brothers and sisters. Listen to his prayer about, about these brethren. What does he say about these brethren? First of all, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you. Brethren, one of the key themes of the book of Philippians is joy. This is the, the deep theme. I, you know, I was looking at some of these uh, authors who are writing on the book. They think the biggest theme of this book is maturity. Ah, yeah, maturity is part of it. But in the main, the biggest theme here is what? Joy. Do you know that the Apostle Paul mentions the word joy 17 times here? Yeah. In one letter, he mentions the word joy 17 times. One, seven times. And there are four areas of joy. The first one, the first area that is mentioning about joy is that as God's people, we need to rejoice in our suffering. Church, when you go through suffering, that's the time when we need to rejoice. Can I see a show of hands of those who rejoice when they are suffering? And he's not talking about motivational speaking uh, joy. Now, you know motivational speaking saying, what do they say? What do motivational speakers say when people are going through stuff, uh, problems? Be positive. <laughs> and you go home, there's nothing to be positive about. Eh? Yeah, uh, if you can think about it, if you can imagine it, you can achieve it. And you don't have a qualification. Like, how does that work? That's what motivation is. That's the kind of motivation they give you. No, listen to Paul. Paul is saying, you need to rejoice when you suffer. But why should we rejoice when we suffer as God's people? Why should we rejoice when we suffer? Why did he rejoice? He's also going to say we need to be patient in our suffering like Christ was. How can we suffer? How can we rejoice? Brethren, this is the biggest question I want to leave you with before I sit down. And if you can give me an answer, I'm telling you I'm sitting down. If you don't give me an answer, we're here until 8 o'clock. How about that? Okay. How do you suffer? How do you rejoice? What can make you rejoice when you serve? Sister Masin? Yeah, can you get the mic? Eh? 
jealousy, yeah? She has this crazy jealousy, yeah. Is it possible to rejoice when you suffer? It's hard. It's hard. Um, but I think that once you internalize that our real joy is salvation. Yeah. That's not perishable. Yeah. Regardless of what happens. Yeah. You are able to rejoice because you have that gift that surpasses any other gift or mm -hmm. any other experience that you have had. So you can look beyond the present suffering because of the hope you have, salvation you have. Okay, let's get Brother Spusis. So this one is very important so that when we start with it next week, we understand. Uh, I think for me what comes to my mind is that it's, uh, it's like when we suffer, it's, it's for the greater good. Mm. The circumstances might be bad, but it's one of those things that when you are suffering, it's not in vain. Yeah. There's that greater good that's going to happen at the end. And I think my second point, it's also has that deeper understanding with God. You see, when you understand God and you have seen him, what God is working in your life, you will rejoice. But it, it takes time and like most of you say, it's difficult yeah. because it requires you to be matured. Okay. Brethren. Did Paul suffer? What type of suffering? Brother Martin, how did Paul suffer? He says, I suffered from natural disasters. I suffered from my own brethren. I suffered from beasts, wild beasts. I suffered from the Jews. As a result of the Jews, I suffered as a result of what? Even the Gentiles. By the way, when he was arrested in the book of Acts chapter 16, he was arrested in Rome and the Jews were not involved in it. It was the Gentiles that were involved because they were doing their things. They were So it's the Gentiles, it's not the Jews. But usually whenever Paul is in trouble, it's because of the Jews. And so Paul is saying, which is my last point, it doesn't matter. My personal comfort does not matter. What matters is what is accomplished as a result of my suffering. He's saying, as a result of my suffering, as a result of my imprisonment, the gospel is spreading throughout the Praetorian God. I mean, Paul was a very interesting one. They would, have, they would arrest him. And while they arrest him, he continues to preach the gospel to them. Eh? Imagine you have, you have uh, this virus that is there, and you're in a hospital. People are expecting you to be sad. But instead of you being sad, you're telling them God loves you. So I think, brethren, as God's people, it's possible to rejoice when we suffer, if we understand what is important. What is important is not your comfort. What is important is that Christ is preached. What is important is not your status. Ah, other people are preaching out of envy. Other people are preaching. That's not what matters. Paul is saying it doesn't matter. Whether people are preaching out of envy, what matters is that what Christ is preached. I'm telling you, if you can get to that stage in your life where you know what really matters and know that your comfort does not matter, what matters is that Christ is, is preached. That will enable you to rejoice even though you're going through struggles for the sake of the gospel. My darling, doesn't matter. Yeah. What you go through, it doesn't matter. What matters is what that people have been saying. Sister Tahan, where's Sister Tahan? Ah, she's out. She knew I'm going to talk to her. It doesn't matter. Brother Tahan, what you go through for the sake of the gospel, it doesn't matter. What matters is that the gospel. Is preached. Brother Martin, doesn't matter. It might take you longer to do whatever you want 
to fulfill your aspirations, but you need to know what is important. What is important is that hip hop is growing. Church, that to me, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether I'm losing out on opportunities. It doesn't matter whether things are happening around me. What matters is that as a result of my involvement in this work, Hilltop is growing. I'm telling you, if all of us can reach a stage as preachers, you know, that is why at Hilltop, we don't matter, it doesn't matter who preaches, isn't it, on Sunday? In other congregations, where people are holding the pulpit, you know? Because what matters is your position as a preacher. And you talk, what matters is that the gospel is what? Preached. Sit down with yourself, sister, and sit and ask yourself, what is important? Isn't it? Is it important for you to go to Mauritius? I'm sure you could go, afford to go to Mauritius, isn't it? But because you have determined in your life what matters, that the gospel. Okay, let me sit down. Karamakuba is making me sit down. It doesn't matter. All these things. Whether, whether you, 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 you silence me, it doesn't matter. What matters is that Oksala Yomzuile. That's what matters. Guys, your comforts don't matter. And sometimes we think our comforts are everything to God. No. What matters is that as a result of your discomfort, what is the outcome? The outcome is that hip hop is growing. Hallelujah. Sister, Hope, I know you can go to Mozambique anytime eh? with your husband and Brother Madero. But Brother Madero always, have we, have we made sure that we give it to him? But darling, we have done it. Or maybe it's him who was But Hope, what? It doesn't matter. What matters is that Christ is preached. Church, yeah. it doesn't matter. Brother, like it, it doesn't matter, bro. That you spend all this petrol from where? From uh, where do you come from, my brother? Uh, yeah, Albert's done, you come here. What matters is what you're going to get here. That is what is important. I hope you are encouraged by the Apostle Paul's attitude. I'm telling you, if we can have the Apostle Paul's attitude, we, we can stop being irritated by petty things. I mean, here's the Apostle Paul. He was tempted to be irritated by the fact that other people are doing this to spite him. But I'm telling you, if you can have this attitude that was in the Apostle Paul, small things will stop being big issues in your life. Let's ask Brother Matiroma Senior to uh, close with